Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Student Hub Live. Welcome to the Open University. Well, I'm not really in the Open University because, of course, we're not allowed in the building yet, but um, part of being a wonderful global leading institution specialising in distance learning is that that doesn't stop us from all getting together. And I'm so excited to be hosting today's event. So this is my gang, and I'm a lecturer in um, the Learning and Innovation Cross-Curricular neck of the university. We deal with the open and access and all things non-modular. So for today's event, we thought we'd open our Freshers program with a big discussion. And I've got a panel of experts here. But one thing that's so special about Open University students is that so many of you are experts in many areas. So we had to think about some hot topics we'd like to discuss with you. And that's going to be the focus of today's program. Now, I know that there are lots of you out there. Some are super nervous, super excited, and we've got some Student Hub Live regulars in the chat. So thank you for coming along and reassuring you students. If you're nervous, the time to stop feeling nervous is now because you will be joined in your learning journey by so many fantastic people. And Student Hub Live is the OU's live online interactive platform to facilitate academic community. And we do a whole range of sessions. We do broadcast events like these, and we also do study skills workshops. And if you're a new student, on Saturday to celebrate module start, we've got a whole range of workshops to bring you up to speed and show you things like the virtual learning environment, etc. So check out the range of options we've got, um, and you can do that on the Student Hub Live website. Now, in this session today, we've got our chat, which many of you have been saying hello to each other using emojis, saying where you're from. And we also have our widgets or interactive voting tools. And you'll see those on the screen. We've asked you things like where you are and how you're feeling and what level you're studying, which subjects you're studying. And we've also got some word clouds. So to select any of the widgets, you just click on the item that you'd like to tell us a bit more about and fill them in. Now, for the word clouds, because there are three boxes, you do need to select three things. But if you can't think of three things, just put a cross or a full stop in the box. And then when you've submitted your results, you can see what everyone else at home thinks as well. So we've got some specific widgets that we've got to generate uh, interest in our topic areas for discussion today. So we'd love it if you could have a go and fill those in. There's no right or wrong answers. And one of the things that we celebrate in this part of the university is diversity of thinking and the approach that different people have and the different lenses that people use to interrogate different topics. Now, I know that some of you in the chat have already mentioned the pin. The chat can move fast. You can turn the chat off if you'd like to as well. And the video for this will be available after the broadcast today. But if you'd like to talk in the chat and it's moving a bit quickly, there's a pin button. So you can select that and hold it and move it down if there's something that you've missed. But as I say, this is your hour. You choose how much you want to engage with. You can sit back and relax and have a cup of tea, or you can make the most of this wonderful opportunity to talk to other Open University students. So as I've said, you can catch up after the session and also you can look at the website and subscribe to our mailing list so you can find out about future events. But let's start with the topic at hand. So our promotion for this event was about the growing evidence um, that suggests that Possessing knowledge and understanding across a whole range of different topic areas is key when facing global challenges. And as I said, we've picked some pretty hefty global challenges, which we're going to talk about today. So we have our fantastic wheel and I'll be spinning this and stopping it with the, the break here. We've had to improvise a little bit because um, unfortunately one of the problems with global pandemics is um, that uh, the production department have been slightly waylaid. But anyway, my daughter didn't really like riding her bicycle. Um, so when it stops, we will then see which item we're going to talk about. And then our topic and our panel of experts and you at home um, will be enjoying a delightful conversation about this. So to talk about um, all of your contributions at home, I am joined by Jay and Helen. Jay and Helen, do you want to say hello? Morning. How's everyone at home? What are they eating right now, Jay? Oh, we've got a lot of talk about um, coffee and how people have either had their coffee and that's what they're fueled by. And I definitely fall into that camp. Or we have quite a few people saying they have not yet had their morning cup of coffee and they're sort of missing it. Mm, that's tricky. It's OK when we're broadcasting for five hours. Like today, we're bro tomorrow, so we were broadcasting pretty much all day. Then you can go out and get a coffee. But I think for an hour, I would hold off. What do you think, Helen? Yeah, I think so. You don't want to miss anything, do you? Um, people, are <laughs> loving the, uh, people are loving your wheel as well. 
Oh, great, great bit of uh, creative genius there, I think. And as a cyclist, yes. obviously, myself, I, I fully agree. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I wasn't using one of my own bikes, of course. <laughs> no, of course not, no. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Well, let's introduce our panel uh, that we have at home. So first, I'm going to introduce John Baxter, who is the Qualification Director of the Open Degree and is based in the STEM, so that's Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics. Now, John has a passion for folk music and his massive CD collection in the office where he works it's always a talking point in meeting because we often mistake it for books don't we John Well, welcome, John. Thank you for joining us. Um, I also have another John for us today, John Butcher, who is a professor of inclusive education. Now, John has six children, a fact that continues to surprise him and me, actually, and now three grandchildren. Um, but worse than that, he supports West Ham and he used to like dancing to the Smiths. And John, I bet you'd be delighted if people can put in some, uh, some lyrics as well, which you're often trying to sneak in. Who's your favourite artist then, John? Well, you know that, Karen. It's David Bowie, of course. Um, <laughs> but welcome, everybody. Yeah, uh, I'm sitting here in my office in Milton Keynes. It's a kind of dullish day, but I'm looking forward to meeting as many of you as possible today. And good luck with your open university studies. Thank you, John. Uh, Joseph Araya is a plant ecologist at the School of Environment, Earth and Ecosystems, or Triple E's as we sometimes call them, um, and is also a YO33 tutor, one of our access modules. Now, Joseph is often found to be trying to decide whether he should be focusing on his running or cycling uh, or stopping to check new plants in uh, the many parks of Milton Keynes. How are you today, Joseph? Uh, all right, good. Uh, it's uh, a bit dull day, but still good enough for going out. <laughs> good. <laughs> welcome yes, to all our students. Yes, as long as it's not raining. Students. Yes, thank yes, you, Joseph. Yes. And last but by no means least, we have George Curry, who is the co-chair for our Open Box module and is a senior manager for the Access modules. Now, George has been known to sneak show tune lyrics into work meetings to check if anyone is actually listening and paying attention. <laughs> and she certainly hasn't done that in any of the meetings that I have attended, I think. So welcome, George. <laughs> and some wonderful guitar. Hello, hello. We have a very yes. vibrant musical bunch. <laughs> George is a great yes, singer I'm as in... well. I'm in the kids playroom and our music room today. I'm really, really happy to be part of this event and I will be attempting to sneak musical theatre lyrics into this session as well. <laughs> right, so Jay and Helen, the challenge at home is for people to spot those and identify them. Um, I, I, I very much doubt they'll win because when we had a song competition the other day about colours, songs with colours in them, I think John came up with about 40 or so in, in less than two minutes. <laughs> So we must move on. Um, everyone's introducing themselves at home as well, which is absolutely wonderful. And as I said, do make the most um, of this opportunity um, to talk to each other today. So we've got our spinning wheel. We've got our topic areas that we're going to focus on. Now, these are these questions. Climate change. So how can we understand and tackle climate change? Democracy. What is the value of my role in democracy? The Olympics. Is there more to the Olympics than just a sporting competition? Food security. Is food security a new issue? And then for culture and the arts, past and present, what have the arts ever done for us? People of a certain age may resonate with that. And technology and staying healthy. Do the gadgets keep us fit? OK, so we've got word clouds at home. Jay, Helen, everyone filling those in right now? Yes, Karen, we've got some great uh, conversation in the chat. People are loving the widgets. And um, and yeah, we'd really love to know how you're feeling. So this has got some fantastic words on there again. <clears throat> oh, fantastic. Again, Let's take a look quickly and see how everyone's feeling. My coffee. Oh, so we've got excited, which is the biggest word of the day, and nervous. Oh, that, that's very common, but please don't feel nervous if, if you aren't already, because uh, hopefully after today, you'll know that there's some wonderful people at the Open University, including some wonderful students. Harassed by my son. Oh, dear, that doesn't sound very good. Um, people are talking about uh, being killed, um, lost in their career paths, excited, um, worried about COVID. Yeah, there's been a lot of that as well. Um, uh, ready to roll. That's brilliant. Motivated, annoyed, eager, privileged. Fine, ready, relaxed, curls, just showered, crazy, unsure, sleepy. Okay, so lots of lots and lots of different things there. That's all cool and that's all very, very, I guess, normal and just shows what a diverse range of students we have out here today. So 
I think without further ado, let's spin the wheel and then we're going to see which topic we're going to all talk about first. So without further ado. Oh, climate change. Now, I know that's been a very popular no. topic. In fact, wouldn't some of these be excellent essay questions, I think, <laughs> in some of our assignments? So climate change. We're going to talk about that first. And uh, the lead on climate change is John Baxter. Now, one of the important things, I'm going to get my book of definitions out, um, is to define our topic areas. Now, you'll see that we've thought really hard about some of these questions. Um, and it's important that we don't just have a barrage and everything we know about things, because otherwise we'll have a really unfocused discussion. So what we mean by climate change is a change in the average conditions, such as the temperature and rainfall in a region over a long period of time. That's what we're meaning. Scientists have observed the Earth's surface is warming, and many of the warmest years on record have happened in the last 20 years. So it affects all the things that we depend on and value, water, energy, transportation, wildlife, agriculture, culture, ecosystems, and even human health. So that's our sort of starter for 10. So John, how do you approach this subject? And, and what might your perspective be on climate change? Well, I should say that I'm, I'm not a climate change scientist. I was trained as a chemist uh, uh, and an educationalist. And I've brought to bear those uh, uh, sort of areas of expertise on the climate change I I issue. And whenever uh, I've been involved in in teaching climate change, it usually comes down to the to the same to the same thing. We need to have science. We need to understand why we're undergoing these changes. And I think we have understood uh, the basic uh, scientific concepts for quite a long time. But that's not enough. It's a social issue. It's a political issue. It's an economic issue. It's it's the original multidisciplinary issue. You cannot tackle climate. <laughs> You cannot tackle climate change simply by being a scientist. It involves all the areas of expertise. And in fact, that's one of the difficulties that we have is, is that uh, uh, you have to understand such a broad range of issues in order to tackle uh, uh, the, the subject. Absolutely. And it's really interesting, I think, because we've selected people here. Nobody is an expert in any of these areas, which we were very careful about. Otherwise, it would be simply unfair. Um, but it is interesting how we all approach things from, from different angles. Um, Yosef, I wonder if we could get your perspective. I mean, in terms of plants and agriculture, how, how do you see climate change? Yes, climate change is uh, something that will really take us into uncharted territory. Basically, most of our global agriculture is dependent on the weather conditions and rain uh, and the solar um, radiation. So climate change would mean that all these things would be thrown into sort of chaos. I mean, we wouldn't be able to grow what we want where we are used to. So in the future, we have to really think about resilience and having to change what we are going to grow and even if you consider how we are going to transport it as well and how we are going to uh, make sure that everyone in every part of the world can get what they want. I mean, uh, seasons are an issue as well. So it's a really very much interlinked and challenging t topic uh, to deal with. Mm. Yes, if a lot of people in the chat are talking about the seasons and how they used to, um, the seasons seem to have changed so much from when they were younger. It's always a difficult question, I think, because sometimes I think when you're young and don't have any mortgages, the summers can just seem like they're rolling on forever. But is there any sense that the seasons are changing? And I mean, that seems to be in terms of our question about how we can tackle climate change. Sure, we could do things about transportation, etc. But some of those other aspects, I guess, are more challenging to, to change and tackle. Indeed. In fact, uh, there is perceptive change that is happening. The best way to describe climate change is actually climate chaos, in a sense that our seasons will may not be as long or as short as we are used to. So some areas, unfortunately, will be too wet to grow some things, and some areas you wouldn't be able to harvest what you want. So sub-Saharan Africa, for example, is predicted to be drier than what it is. And what that means is uh, that there will be definite change that will result in how we deal with it. So in some parts of the world, for example, they are uh, trying to grow uh, crops that mature very quickly so that they can make some use of the short seasons that they have. 
but in other places there could be challenges with pollinators as well so uh, yeah things have been changing and it is pretty much accepted by everyone but how we respond is the biggest issue and that will involve a lot more not only scientific knowledge but also people getting on and doing with it mm -hmm. Cole says that um, although climate change is, is very much a science-based topic, fixing it seems to be more political. Um, John Butcher, I wonder if you might uh, come in on that. Yeah, thanks, Karen. I think that's a really a, a useful observation there. It seems to me, first of all, I think, um, you know, observing this perhaps for 50 years now, uh, awareness of changing climate used to be a very kind of left field maverick uh, kind of hippie thing almost. And I think now it is much more mainstreamed. But I think what it comes down to is this is such a major global problem that it requires major global solutions. And I think there's a tension between um, countries working together, big business working together, and the kind of actions that individuals might wish to take. I, I, I certainly know many people who try themselves to do small nudges in their lives to, to attempt to limit uh, this problem. But of course, really, it's going to need a much bigger solution than that. Mm. No, absolutely. There's this essence, I think, um, that people are talking about in the chat is the extent to which individuals and society can, can have an impact mm. and where that balance lies. We've had loads of words that come through. George, I'm going to come to you next. But first, could we see what people at home are saying um, in response to our word cloud about climate change? And uh, and then, George, I'm going to come to you and also um, other panelists. It may be that we want to pick up on some of these things as well. There are so many words in here, um, but the ones that are the most repeated are things like fear, urgent, sad, deforestation, sea level rise. I mean, looking at many of these words, a lot of them are associated with fairly negative things. But there are lots of other things here in terms of perhaps things that we could do, such as conserving water. Um, the government should do more. Action is needed. Um, so there are, there are lots of sort of doing words here as well in terms of, I guess, aspects that are being um, changed by, by the climate, such as the polar ice caps, et cetera. George, what, what's, your, what's your sort of take on all of this and what, what do you think we can do? <laughs> A very good question, Karen. Um, well, I, I was reflecting as people were talking about how overwhelming the notion of climate chaos or climate change can be for a, for a normal person just trying to live their lives. And I think this is a really good opportunity for showing the importance of the arts here, because quite often there could be a film or a documentary or a program or an art piece that tells a story that makes it feel a little bit more personal. And it's a bit easier then as an individual at home to comprehend the larger themes through the story of an individual or a family. I'm thinking about films like The Day After Tomorrow, which show near future, which make you think about what it might be like in a slightly more smaller and contextualized sense. I'm thinking of the artist that recorded the noises of a glacier melting. So just those small things resonate often in a more um, heartfelt way and allow people to kind of think about their feelings when the big facts and the big stories are just a bit overwhelming. Um, so I think that's really true. And I think if we think about the documentaries that David Attenborough does, um, this, the, the use of music through those that really helps to stir the emotions and, and bring points home. So I think there are different ways that we can engage with people because obviously change is necessary. Um, but I think we shouldn't underplay the importance of how we communicate the urgency of the situation um, to, mm. to people living their lives with all the pressures that they have. Absolutely. And I think that sense that there are things, there are tangible actions that, that people can do, um, feeling empowered to do those. And I guess realising the impact that all of those actions may then have on the planet is, is so useful. Many students may not know. I don't know how many of you at home have watched things like Frozen Planet, Planet Earth. Um, many of these um, programmes are actually co-productions between the Open University and the BBC. We have um, academics um, who work often in, um, for example, with, with those particular areas, STEM, science, technology, and engineering and mathematics. And we have colleagues um, who, who are academic advisors working um, for these programs. And very often, um, you'll see that at the end, it says, um, find out more at the Open University. And on OpenLearn, which is our site for everybody with lots of information, we'll often give you behind the scenes um, things or um, 
posters that you can put up on your wall as well from those programs so it's worth taking a look at those Helen actually I don't know if you want to plug any other resources if people are interested I know you've been putting a few things in the chat and talking about how we study things at the Open University is there anything you might want to add yeah, so actually we've had some um, nice comments in the chat from people who have been studying some aspects of climate change in modules like um, S201 and U116, and I'm really sorry off the top of my head, I don't know the module titles, um, but just kind of interesting that there are some science modules there and some interdisciplinary modules as well. And actually somebody was saying how important psychology is in all of this, um, and, and obviously George picked up on the arts as well. So really interesting conversation going on in the chat as as well about kind of different uh, subjects and things like that um, and we we have also got some links to some of our open learn courses um, we've got some great resources on open learn as well that we'll share on the the student hub live web page um, for people to be able to go and find out more about it um, and and look at some of those resources as well mm. Interesting. And also, just having a very quick look at the chat, Jay, I wonder if you might sort of want to pull up some of the things people are talking about COVID sort of taking a, a lead front. And there's so much emphasis now on science and the way that we're communicating scientific <clears throat> fact. One of the things I think many Open University students will learn is how to interrogate a, a news source um, from a more solid basis, thinking about who's written it, what they're building the foundations of that knowledge on, etc. It really does shift the way that you think about things. And thinking about how many tobacco companies companies, oil companies, etc., are using doubt in the public's mind to, to flavour mm. things like that. I, I wonder if you might just pull some of those comments um, in, into the discussion. Thank you, Karen. Um, we, we have talked about in the, in the uh, chat the impact on COVID, and I think for many of us, it really brought home the, the local impact of uh, the environment. So I think all of us, as, as colleagues said, you know, we heard the birds singing a lot more. We saw animals out and about. We saw wildflowers blossom. You know, you saw cloud cover or the lack of cloud cover because of the environment wasn't smogging up. And I think in many ways we understood at a local level, the, the kind of the impact of the environment there. So there's a lot of conversation in the chat about that. But also a couple of people talked about instead of calling it climate change, maybe we should use the word climate emergency uh, to really bring home the importance of it. And I think there's also a discussion about the privileged position that sometimes we're in, maybe in the Western world, that we can choose to have actions where we don't, you know, we have recyclable uh, bags or we use bags more than once or we have uh, wooden cutlery or reusable cutlery. So I think there's a lot of talk about that. But I think definitely there's people talking about what actions can we take? What's our personal responsibility? Um, and then obviously, as Helen said, it's coming back to the subjects people are studying and being able to learn more about this and really value uh, their, their open university study. Brilliant day. Well, thank you. I think we should move on to a different topic because um, we could talk about this forever, but there's so much else to cover. So let's spin our wheel again and see what comes up next. Oh, Olympics. <clears throat> Shall we have a quick go at the Olympics? Completely different topic. Um, so th this is actually an interesting one because initially I thought, oh, that could be a bit boring, even though I really love cycling. But the question about the Olympics is, is there more to the Olympics than just a sporting competition? And actually, this is a very interesting topic. So um, the Olympic Games, um, they were, uh, according to my book of definitions, they were um, an ancient Greek festival held every four years in Greece in honor of the Greek god Zeus. Um, but we wanted to sort of be a bit specific here. So we wanted to think about the Olympics as a brand, you know, those famous um, five rings that we're not allowed to show um, because they're so expensive um, and what they stand for and what impact that brand and that whole event has, not just for the athletes who take part, um, but the spectators and also the audience's home. And uh, the motto of the Olympics is from a Latin expression, meaning faster, higher, stronger. So is there more to the Olympics than just a sporting competition? John Butcher, I'd like to come to you first, if I may. Thank you, Karen. Well, uh, we, we ought to say, of course, as uh, is known, uh, the ancient Greeks didn't just have sport in their Olympics. They also had cultural activities and poetry readings and dramas and things like that. And we've, we've kind of slightly lost that along the way, but never mind about that. I think there's a real uh, tension 
a really interesting tension in the Olympics between something incredibly idealistic, which is about bringing nations together and striving to be the best uh, in your particular discipline that you can be, and spectators gathering together in a very safe way and applauding that, and a kind of somewhat corrupted Olympic idea in which it just becomes a massively overwrought, overblown media event with oodles of money spent on things that don't really matter as part of a kind of a cultural declaration by the host nation. So I, I can sit there and enjoy some of the events and I got a bit teary when uh, Great Britain and the United Kingdom held the Olympics and there was that brilliant opening ceremony. But equally, I worry a little bit about the way the Olympics is used politically. Mm. Yes, very interesting. Yeah, I, I often must say I do often shed tears during the Olympics. There's something about it that does make me cry. But, uh, you know, I think when we were preparing for this, we were talking about so many um, massive amounts of investment in some of these sporting events and uh, sporting opportunities that are then, um, you know, supposed to be for local use afterwards and whether or not they're actually used and, and to what extent that money is well and best spent. And as you say, John, you know, the politics behind it is, is monumental. George, what were your thoughts? on it i am not a sporty person i'm just going to put that out there to start with <laughs> but um what i find interesting about large events like the olympics is how easy it is to get swept along and i think we're, we're talking about um the psychology and the notion of social groups that when there's an event happening like that it affects and changes society for that moment that it's on people um who aren't interested in sport at all are suddenly watching curling or uh, quite obscure things that they never felt that they were interested in suddenly becoming incredibly passionate about it. And I think that's a really powerful thing to think about. Um, the theatre practitioner Arto used to say that he wanted to try and bring out the emotions um, that people get from a sporting event in the theatre. There's something so visceral about that, which I find incredibly interesting. The other side of it is that there is something magnificent about watching elite sports people. And I know that my own children have been inspired to take on um, try some sports out for that. So I think there is, I think there is something about it acting as an inspiration and we might end up talking about health um, a little bit later on, but it's those sorts of events that act as touchstones, which um, inspire people to then take up sports and lead more healthy lifestyles perhaps. Absolutely. There's also a comment in the chat as well um, about uh, how sport, you know, can not always be equal in terms of how people can access and get into certain sport. Um, I mentioned about, you know, not everyone can use horses, for example. So that there is a sort of um, an element as well that, that, that there's, there's, I guess, some unfairness involved in sport also. George. Yes, sorry. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's, yeah, that's all right. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. I mean, the, the, the access that different demographics, different people from different nations will be able to have towards sport is obviously wildly different. But I think there is something about, uh, there is something unifying at the same time about the um, about being in the crowd watching. I think that that's a really important way of bringing people together. But of course, um, there are always injustices and some some equestrian sports as I, I wouldn't have the cl a clue how to go about doing any of that um th some like ice skating all of these things you have to have access to them so in some ways you can feel like an insider like you're part of the crowd cheering everybody on but you can also feel like you're an outsider and not not part of that not understanding how to access it and different Mm. No, absolutely. But people also saying, you know, that things like after the London Games, transportation improved, etc. So there are many positive aspects. Yes, if I wonder what your take is on this. Yosef, how do you think uh, about the Olympics? And uh, do you think it is more than just a sporting competition? Yeah, uh, indeed. I think uh, it's quite fascinating to see it is, maybe it has something positive in a way I look at it, tackling global challenges. It's when everyone is kind of pulling together. Of course, there is national agendas, local agendas, but if you really look at it, it is nations coming together. And that's the sort of thing we need with uh, issues like food security is we have to pull together. Uh, there is to some extent protectionism and considering only one's interest and you probably hear about 
because of the improve you know the climate expected climate change for example some countries are hoarding land somewhere else halfway across the world and that sort of national interests should be tempered by looking at a global issue so i think the olympics is a good uh, way to get everyone to the same agenda and i hope and i really look forward that uh, we kind of use it uh, i don't know food for olympics something like that Jay and Helen, um, I see there's lots and lots of words that are filled in on the word cloud at home. So I wonder if we could take a look before I come to you, John Baxter, um, and say, see what people at home um, have been talking about in terms of the words that spring to mind. There's lots here. Um, and let's see, competition is right at the beginning. But there has been um, a, some discussion, I think, as well about the extent to which that competition is for elite or amateurs and who can be involved. And also, um, uh, you know, when the Olympics were cancelled, you know, training over four years um, to peak at that particular event can have a huge impact for people. For many people, you know, that four years could be the end of a career, for example. Um, so there are lots and lots of things in there, lots of um, political ideas and, and money related uh, comments also. Jay and Helen, or, or Jay first, I'll come to you. Thanks, Karen. Uh, yeah, there's some really interesting comments in the chat. And, and I think it's quite interesting because a bit like George, I don't think I'm very sporty at all. Um, but I think there's lots of comments about the pride that we feel. For me, the Olympic ceremony is always something I will watch. Uh, and it was directed by Danny Ball last time. And it was a very political, but very interesting to watch. Uh, there's a lot of talk about public money. There's a lot of talk about money management, money mismanagement. Great. And Helen, how about you? Yeah, so as Jay said, like lots of interesting um, things going, uh, comments going on in the in the chat. There's quite a bit of talk about inequality as well um, and how, you know, whether there is fairness within the Olympics, but also how it can be uh, an opportunity for, um, you know, people to be uh, to get involved in sporting events and, and kind of instill that excitement in people. Um, I particularly liked a, um, a, a chat thread that was going on around Daily Thompson's Decathlon, which was like a computer um, game back in the day. And uh, <laughs> people enjoyed that. And that brought back memories because I can, come from a very sporting family. So I spent many a happy hour playing Daily Thompson's Decathlon as well. So <laughs> yeah, and people talking about the, the, the different, um, uh, the different sports that they like watching and you'll be pleased to know Karen that triathlon is in there I know you're a keen triathlete so, yes um, yeah that that's featured in there too and some velodrome cycling as well good excellent good 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 and isn't it interesting how you know while we're talking about some fairly distinct topics and in fact we tried to select these so that they were very separate from each other actually there are ways in which they connect as well as in particular with the politics um and as, as joseph mm -hmm. was saying you know the sort of national identities i guess um and, and i think this is something that's come through quite clearly is that you know one of the senses of pride and coming together can be very important so i come last but not least to you john baxter um and see what uh, <laughs> what your thoughts were and and also whether any of this discussion has maybe um inspired any new ways of thinking for you well I'm afraid it, 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 that I looked at the word cloud and I could pick out the things that, 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 that resonated with me and the big word competition in the middle. I mean, I think all sporting competitions are political in, in one sense, in that they naturalize the idea that we should be competing against one another. And is that something that we should celebrate? So, that, so I can't help admitting that I do watch sporting competitions. I do watch the Olympics, but at the same time, I'm deeply doubtful about some of the ideals behind them and the idea that we should be that our main allegiance should be to our nation state for example uh, and uh, you know whilst I, I loved the, the beginning of the London Olympics at the same time I was thinking in, in every competition should I be wanting Britain to win maybe I should be wanting Sierra Leone to win or somebody else like that looking to support the, un, the, un, the, un, the underdog and I saw uh, in the word cloud issues of competition and politics. And I guess the other thing that occurs to me is that whilst the Olympics is held up as 
this sort of idealistic above above politics. It's so political. You know, it used to be that the Russians invested so heavily in in, in training their their athletes to try and beat America. America boycotted the Olympics when they didn't like what Russia was doing in Afghanistan. You know, over the years, oh, and 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 people, you know, the the um, the Black Lives Matter campaign and look, reflecting back to the, the Black Power salute of the black athletes in the 60s, all of that stuff shows how intensely the, the, the Olympics is a is a political event as well as a sporting event. And uh, and uh, I, I don't know that that really came home to me looking at looking at word cloud. I'm clearly not the only person that has these sorts of doubts about about, about it. It's not. You know, I'm not saying I don't watch it. I'm not saying it, it, it's something that should be ignored. But at the same time, I think thinking critically about these events and, and what role they have in society is an important thing as well. Mm, absolutely. And people saying at home as well that they're getting a lot of inspiration from the Paralympic Games as well. We've just been obviously talking about the o Olympics because there are many, many different sporting events, um, all of which bring to light very, very different issues. I remember a discussion um, I had some time ago actually about gender um, when uh, a lot of yes. testosterone levels were being measured and, you know, the extent to which someone could be categorised as a male or female was very rife in the Olympics. So it's not just politics. There are so many angles. W would any of our panel, you can just raise your hand if you'd like to come in before we move on um, to the next discussion. Is there anything else anyone would like to just add in there? Nope, they all want to get on to democracy. I know, see, I know exactly what, what you're all think. Oh, no, John does. John Butcher. <laughs> uh, Ka Karen, thank you. It's not, not like me to let a gap go unfilled. Um, <laughs> pro I, I, just just to, pick, to pick up on John's very important point about competition, I would draw an analogy with... Um, the, the use of league tables. So we get out, we, we're all interested or the, the media are interested, all their kind of gold medal tables and how we did in the league tables, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that kind of infects the, uh, the purity and the innocence of the games, I think, much in a way that the use of league tables for universities and schools <laughs> and other aspects of life have, uh, you know, are, are a really bad thing. So I wonder if we could be, is it possible to have competition without league tables? I, I don't know. Maybe it isn't. But the, uh, the misuse of league tables, there's your problem. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, I hope we manage to avoid the political, actually, as we spin our wheel next. That, that may perhaps be the best idea. But nonetheless, let's see what we have in store uh, for our next discussion. Oh, ah, there we are. So, culture and the art. Right. Let me, oh, let me reframe us. So, <laughs> culture and the arts, past and present. Our question uh, is, what have the arts ever done for us? So, we have decided to define, Jay and I spent a long, an interesting conversation actually looking up all our definitions for these from a range of sources. We, we're calling the art something that's created with imagination and skill or that expresses important ideas or feelings. We took out the sense that art had to be beautiful. So this is about imagination and skill and expressing important ideas or feelings. So, uh, George. Let me come to you first with those fabulous guitars in the background there. <laughs> what do you think the arts have ever done for us? Well, as, uh, as we learned from Dead Poet Society, science and politics are incredibly important and necessary to sustain life. But without art and poetry and beauty, what are we staying alive for? And in fact, Winston Churchill said um, when he was asked about cutting arts funding in favour of the war effort, he said, then what are we fighting for? So really arts, the arts, the broad, the broad definition is where we find joy in our lives. And I think, um, you know, if we, if we stop to think about um, a world without music or a world without be uh, pictures to look at or a world without drama to reflect back the society that we're living in, I think it would be a much for, uh, poorer place. But specifically thinking about the importance of the arts in an education context, um, I think there are, there are skills that young people and, and older people um, are able to develop and demonstrate through learning the arts in a slightly different way than they would in any other. So confidence, I think, is a really, really big one. I know personally, I'm, I'm much happier in this sort of scenario as a result of um, having been on the stage in various theatre productions or standing up in front of people about to sing. I think it gives you a confidence, which is really important. I think the art of collaboration 
comes through when uh, young people are in a band together or putting together a piece of theatre. And I think those those collaboration skills where you're coming together with different purposes and different elements of expertise, but having to work together is an incredibly important skill to him to to, to develop things like fine motor skills in young children. Um, these these are really really important things that um, that the arts enable and and bring people. And I think uh, an education without the arts is a poorer one. But then I right, would say that's that. it. we should send all the politicians to drama school. I think George, don't you think that would solve many of our problems today? One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Show them all educating so, Rita. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, John Butcher, might I come to you now? Because uh, lockdown has highlighted some specific things to do with the arts. And I know you've been spending some time uh, reflecting on the value that the arts have um, in where we're at now. Mm. No, thanks, Karen. And I just want to echo George's comments there. I think there's uh, there's two aspects really to why the arts are arguably the most important things that human beings have ever done. And that, that is a, a, a both um, participating in the arts, so doing things, and that certainly is an incredible, uh, it's a confidence booster, it's a shared activity, and it's an aspect of communication that I think is irreplaceable by anything else. So uh, we'll, we'll park that just for a moment. I think the really interesting one is what something that is now quite unfashionable, which we might call art appreciation. So it's simply engaging with, and it, it, it could be, this is with George, it could be musical theater, it could be painting or sculpture, <laughs> it could be poetry, it could be a, a, a whole host of things. Uh, and I've certainly noticed during lockdown that uh, people have felt starved of access to live arts, where, whether they, they couldn't get to gigs or concerts or they couldn't go around galleries. And I've been quite encouraged by the way in which with the uh, the advent of kind of live streaming of events, people have been able, to, people who've been stuck at home have perhaps been able mm -hmm. to engage with the, with arts in, in a way that, that they might not have otherwise. So I, I certainly have, have looked at kind of uh, drama performances that I wouldn't have otherwise seen. I've looked at music concerts that I wouldn't otherwise have seen. And I think what you, what you get with those is a, a, a sometimes uh, quite profound subjects are raised. So issues around life and death, issues around um, love, issues around um, emotions. Uh, and I think uh, the arts can broach those and get us thinking about those in a way that no other discipline can. And therefore, I would certainly argue that all um, children at school ought to engage in the arts. And I would argue that all students at university should do a kind of open degree so that even the scientists get some arts, even the business school do some arts as well. My final point is that there, there's a really lovely example from a, a, a medical school in Scotland where they teach doctors empathy skills by doing a module on poetry. So there's something really important there. Thank you. <laughs> Helen, I wonder if I can just come to you um, because people at home are talking about the um, uh, the sort of way in which we will often compartmentalise things. So some STEM students are saying at home, oh, you know, you, you need um, art as well. So even though I'm studying STEM, I do appreciate the value and, and the extent to which sometimes you need that creativity or, or level of expression within STEM to, for example, engineer something or create something. So these categories, even though arts is, is technically a discipline, isn't quite as clear cut. And it's very interesting that people are picking up on this at home. Yeah, um, we've had some really interesting comments from people, actually. Um, we've got Anna, who who uh, declares herself as a, a stuffy law student. <laughs> I'm not sure that's the case, but, um, you know, uh, saying how arts make you feel, make your soul feel alive, which I think is lovely, whether that's literature, film, theatre, music or art. And like you say, um, you, you know, you need arts for STEM. Um, Eliza is saying you need arts for STEM or you'd never have beauty in what you've made. And so there's some really nice comments in there about, you know, people seeing the the um, the links between um, STEM and arts as well. Quite a lot of um, talk as well, coming back to what John Butcher was saying around schools and education. So quite a few comments around um, yeah, uh, 
you know, the arts being cut from uh, various uh, school curriculum and things like that. Um, so yeah, some really, really interesting comments and I'm just about to, to post a note to see if anybody is studying an open degree because obviously that's, you know, that's yeah. our favourite. <laughs> and of course, we, we, we have a very interesting way of, of studying music at the um, Open University as well. So any uh, students out there who may want to combine music with other arts, etc. Many students do do that, um, can uh, can do that as part of um, a new qualification in music. So, um, but you can find out all about those on, on the website. Another interesting point, um, I think, to do with, with COVID is that, you know, for many of us, we can't really sing anymore. And I think that people talking about um, the way that arts are being cut from curriculum and schools um you know many uh, i'm in the welsh valleys well not the valleys actually but I'm, I'm in wales and many of the the boys they go in these big male voice choirs and they're absolutely stunning but they can't sing together anymore and virtual singing just doesn't quite cut it um in the same way um you know playing um instruments at school may have different limitations because of the the restrictions etc and that that can feel quite sad i think that, that some of those areas of expression are being taken away from us right now as well um yosef uh, how how do you sort of um, inter interpret um, the arts? What, what do you think they've done for us? Yeah, I, I was actually pleased to hear from George and John about the importance of art and not only as for doing it, but also learning and appreciating. I mean, it's very easy to think of food as fuel. And in the last 50 years or so, what we have been focusing is producing as much food as we can as bland with not much for room for experimenting and for using things and people have removed most of let's call it the art of food production and food consumption into somewhere else and they have left it off now with awareness and especially even though the pandemic had meant people are discovering the art of bread making at home the art of using food uh, and reducing waste and uh, i feel there is a lot in the arts that can come and help us not only educate ourselves and also but make those small changes that make us appreciate and uh, make a difference to topics like food security. So the arts, uh, I'm pleased to say, have a lot to help us communicate what we study in science to the general public, but also make it of a personal feeling. So we know where our meat is coming from, where our food is being grown and how and who is producing it and how we can use it. So I'm a fan of the arts personally. <laughs> <laughs> and so many I, mean, I know Jay you've had supper clubs and things oh sorry my dog's barking um, as, uh, as part of the, um, uh, the lockdown you've, you've had supper clubs and you've shared food and very much used um, food as a way of expressing and giving and nourishing other people. I'm just going to give my dog a treat come here Maggie come on <laughs> nope she's barking it's the door go for it Jay <laughs> Yes, I mean, I really love cooking. And I think for me, uh, cooking is the way that I express myself. Um, and, and I, you know, I've, I've got a background in the arts and I love the arts. So kind of, you know, singing and cooking at the same time is, is perfect for me. Um, but I think there's something lovely about whatever you do, whatever works for you, um, just being able to kind of revel in that, and enjoy that. And somebody put a really nice uh, quote in the chat about how, you know, music uh, kind of skips our ears, skips everything else, but just goes straight to our souls. And I think the, the lovely thing about whatever we do that is a creative outlet, it just feeds us, it inspires us. And I think for many of us, we've needed that in this time more than ever. Um, and there's some really fantastic comments in the chat just about how art um, and the arts in general supports our mental health as well you know so whatever you do whatever helps you it just speaks to your mental health and 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 I know that I have just loved um thinking about some of the the photography competitions out there thinking some of the art galleries the way they've reached out and uh, I know John and I've talked a lot about the National Theatre and the Globe Theatre and how they gave us you know fantastic things to watch that actually we wouldn't have had in in normal times 
Yeah. And even some of the um, access to objects. I mean, I know that um, if you're a student studying arts and visual cultures at the OU, um, you'll get 3D ways of looking at artefacts you could never normally even go and do in an art gallery. Um, but many mainstream art galleries are also using some of those approaches to be able to, to showcase things that we wouldn't have been able to see so up close and personal before. Um, John Baxter, let's come to you and then we're going to try and have one more topic of conversation. I think just just really briefly, I think when you said that people can't sing together, they can't sing and harmonize. But I was involved in an event last night where I was singing with people from America, from Ireland and from all over England. And we were all sharing songs. Now, we're only one person can sing at a time, but it's opened up the, the COVID crisis has opened up opportunities to meet like minded people from all over the world, which I never had before. Uh, which, which is very, very inspiring. But just very finally, as well as scientists appreciating the arts, which I think is incredibly important and, 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 should, and should be pursued, I think it's also important that people who get trained in the arts should have a reasonable understanding of science. And I'm, you know, it, I, I don't think it's in polite society, I don't think it should be acceptable that you say, I don't understand maths in, any, in the same way as it shouldn't be acceptable as when you say, I don't understand poetry or, or, or whatever. It should be part of our makeup. And in order to be critically engaged democratic citizens, I think at the moment, more than ever, to, to, to be able to look at a graph and say, that's not quite right, is a skill that we should all, we should all have in, in, in keeping our leaders called to account, shall I say. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Mm, absolutely. And people saying about, which is a really important point about the singing um, in, the, in the chat as well. And I think we, we did that at a team meeting, didn't we, George, where you, you taught us songs and, and we had a wonderful <laughs> team meeting, actually, in, in one of our tea time sessions. Um, but it's just, I guess, made us think differently. So perhaps it's not that we can't necessarily do the same things. We just need to be a little bit more creative about how we go about doing those, don't we, George? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think I think that was that was a real it was a real moment for our team when we all had a go at singing, um, and obviously there's there's delays, so it wasn't the most beautiful thing anyone has ever heard. But it really, um, I'm sure, but it really was a moment where we all joined together. And I was reflecting as people were talking about our previous conversation about the Olympics and competition and who's won and league tables. And the beautiful thing about the arts is it's not about competition. It's about trying to do your absolute best, but so that the whole is amazing so that everybody can win and that everybody becomes better because you are becoming better. There isn't any sense of, I mean, of course there are elite performers and singers, but everybody can join in and there isn't ever, there shouldn't ever be a sense of trying to beat somebody in the arts, which I think makes it an incredibly friendly and lovely place. And just my final thing, um, I have to say this, uh, is that it's a really brilliant way of thinking into disciplinarity. So those of you that know me will know that I quite like the musical Hamilton. <laughs> There you go, Jay, got it in. Now, that is a really great opportunity of how audiences can learn about a period in history. They can think about the choreography. They can think about the lights and how that's working. There is a really interesting um, approach to casting that's happened there, which talks about um, uh, the way that societies interact in America at the moment. So just that one piece of theatre you can look at from about 12 different angles, no matter what your interest is. So I think I think people disregard the arts um, at their folly. <laughs> But if, if anyone at home could have seen our whole screen of people, everyone was shaking their head when George started to talk about Hamilton, which he often does. Um, but um, at least I know how you've snuck those lyrics into meetings, George, now. And, and I can see there was one when it definitely did happen. Um, somebody sharing a comment about making friends with somebody walking down the street playing the ukulele and, and how you can just really get on with people um, at a very base level, I guess, um, just through something really... I know we, we, we've talked about whether art is beautiful or not, but I guess meaningful um, and, and beauty in its own way is, is just so important. Right, let's have one last go. We've only got um, seven minutes left, so let's make it a good, quick, sharp one. Oh, we've done that. Let's see. 
Oh, democracy. Right. Let's let's end with a bang, not a whimper, guys. OK, so democracy. Our question is, what is the value of my role in democracy? Um, so definitions. Um, the word democracy comes from two Greek words, meaning um, rule by people, rule by the people. Um, in a democracy, the people have to say in how the government is run. So they have a say in how the government's run. They do this by voting, although they are usually rules about who can and vote. Democracy is to be thought of as power of the people. Actually, it took Jay and I a very long time to get a, a sort of definition of democracy that we were sort of happy with because there were so many different um, connotations and implications in some of the words. But John Butcher, let me come to you first then um, about this. What is the value of your role in democracy? To what extent do people make a difference? This is a big one for the last seven minutes, Karen. OK, so the people have the authority. Two sorts, direct democracy, I'll come to that in a minute, and representative democracy, in which people uh, elect representatives to deliberate on their behalf. It depends on things like uh, the rule of the majority, having a constitution to protect minority interests, holding elections, freedom of speech, freedom of association. This is all stuff we should take for granted. But let's think about what the opposite of democracy is. Aristocracy, the rule of the elite. Oligarchy, rule of a small number of individuals. Dictatorships, tyranny. None of this we want. So in our country, and we should protect it with our, and some people have protected it with their blood, we have a parliamentary sovereignty system in which there is judicial independence. It goes right back to Magna Carta. And I'll just pop in two quotations to uh, move everybody along. Uh, famous one, uh, 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 allegedly by Churchill, but I think Churchill admitted he got it from somewhere else. He said, it has been said that democracy is the worst form of government. All those other forms of government that have been tried from time to time, so it's our least, worth, least worst way of living our lives. And Lincoln said, no man is good enough to govern another man without that other's consent. So that notion of your one's rights and the constitution in a society is very important. And I said I'd mention something about direct democracy. So think about people who live in families. To what extent is your family a direct democracy? Does everybody in your family have an equal voice? And if not, why? Thank you. <laughs> Oh, John, some food for thought. We're going to take a look at our word cloud. I like this comment that Eliza said, if you force voting, you get a lot of people voting badly. Let's see what everyone at home has said. There's so many words coming up. Right. Slap bang in the middle of our word cloud is fairness um, and broken and voting and choice, equality, freedom, voice, power, people, change. Um, many, many other words in here as well. Um, so it, intrinsic to society, currently threatened, necessary, um, a great idea, uh, capitalism. Um, I'm going to just hold this up for a second so people can read it. Um, and then I think uh, we will come to you next, uh, John Baxter, um, and see what, uh, what your take on all of this is. So any ideas there that have uh, sprung any new thoughts for you, John Baxter, in uh, your role in democracy? I saw, I saw, I saw all sorts of words. I saw illusion. I saw helplessness as as a word. And I guess there's a concern that if you have representative democracy organised into political parties, what if you feel there's no political party that represents you? Is that really democracy? Do you really have a choice? Uh, and and uh, you know, we, we we very tightly delimit what we vote about or in representative democracies, we don't vote about when the train should run. Should a democracy have more direct controls over our, every, our, our everyday lives rather than divorcing it up, you know, through through representative structures? I think there's, there's interesting questions around that. I know I was um, shouting at the television as I often do. Uh, when we were talking about the trains this morning and all the money that they're going to have to give to the train companies to keep the trains running. Now, environmentally, I don't think it's question. We, we should we can't question what, why it's valuable to have trains, but but you know politically, I say, well, why aren't why why don't we have a say in how they're run how they're run then? Why aren't we 
well, why aren't we nationalizing the trains and making them making them accountable to people through dem democratic structures? So I, I think for me, the, I mean, again, there are, there are there are huge questions there, and again, it's a it's a case where where we need to engage critical thinking, and I think that's one of the key things about being a being a student is that uh, and and well and and being in a, in a university is being part of a university is a community of critical thinkers and i hope that's coming across in the discussion today we don't all agree on everything but one thing i hope we agree on is that we have we have to look at look at look at things and be critical and question and and in democracy i think that's that's absolute that's absolutely key Brilliant. Thank you so much, John Baxter. Um, I'm going to have to draw this to a close, unfortunately, but I'd just like to come back to Jay and Helen because there's been so much discussion. And might I say, I am so impressed with the way that everybody's been changing the, the flow of the topic so instantly in the chat when these are such <laughs> massive issues. Um, you guys must have, have had your hands and fingers full typing, etc. So Jay, what's your, what's your final word from everyone back at home? I think, you know, as you say, the chat has been full on and it's been fantastic. So wonderful chat, really great uh, energy from everybody in the in the chat in terms of the conversations, the things that they've been offering, uh, which has been brilliant. And I've just got to say, it's been wonderful because you've had a real mix of people who are regular viewers of Student Hub Live, which is fantastic. We've also had some new people here today. So, you know, that's been wonderful uh, to have them included with such a great session. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Jay, and thank you for coming and meeting everyone. Helen, what about you? Yeah, I'd agree with everything Jay said, and I, I think the panel have done a really great job as well of demonstrating, you know, what we wanted to get across today was just that, um, as John says, you know, we need critical thinkers, we need people to, you know, challenge, but also to respect each other's opinions and, and you know, also how those, how different subjects can all come together and, and add value uh, mm -hmm. to each other. So, um, yeah, brilliant, brilliant. It's been hard work. I have to say on the social media desk trying to keep up with everything so thank you to everybody for the contributions and keeping us up to guide this morning it has and and the other thing i've really noticed is that there's been some really fruitful discussions and disagreements everyone's mm. been so respectful to each other picking up points and expanding on them suggesting other viewpoints etc um, and if anyone was nervous i mean this is exactly the sort of way in which we like to articulate and communicate and and have those academic discussions mm. and recognize that different perspectives different lenses yeah. um all add different approaches and it's just important to be able to contextualize where you're coming from and, and what your evidence source is um and these have been wonderful discussions that we've had today. So um, if anybody's new, um, I hope that this has set you up uh, to, to feel super happy and confident and to introduce you to some wonderful colleagues at the Open University as well. Like I said, at the start of today's programme, we have a lot of other events. We've got events on tomorrow and on Wednesday. Um, now, some of these are faculty events, but there's something there for everybody. So um, please do have a look at the programme and come along to the sessions or just come along for a cuppa and talk to other students, particularly um, if you found these sessions useful um, and you can come and reassure everybody because I hope that those of you who've met the likes of Tala and Eliza who've been so wonderful and helpful in the chat and reassuring to you all know it's so nice to have a friendly face in the chat as well. So please do come along to other sessions, sign up for our workshops. We've got a whole host of things throughout the academic year to help you with things like essay planning and writing and developing an academic argument and time management and those are in Adobe Connect and the tickets are very limited so please please do take a look at the website and sign up to our mailing list as well so that you can be the first to know when we release events, which are normally around three weeks or so um, before they're held. But like I say, we've got a whole heap of programs um, to keep you busy just before modules start. Thank you though so much to our panel, um, to John Baxter, John Butcher, um, Yosef and George, and of course, Jay and Helen as well, and everybody behind the scenes who's helped make this program so super for us today. But most of all, thank you at home for coming and contributing contributing so wonderfully and wholesomely to this discussion. I hope you can join us at another event very, very soon. And don't forget to subscribe to our mailing list so that you can keep track of what we're up to. Bye for now and thank you for watching.